Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Ben Kalos, Chair of the Committee. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. We are joined today by the Progressive Caucus. I mean Council Members Carlos Menchaca, Antonio Reynoso, and Richie Torres. We're also joined by uh, Council Member Borelli, uh, who is apparently interested in joining the Progressive Caucus. And uh, since we do have a quorum, uh, we'll begin with a vote on introductions 807A, 810A, and 812A. As of November 2015, the city was owed $1.58 billion in outstanding ECB debt. Uh, that money, if collected, could be spent on things like universal free lunch for our students, facil fa facilities for our seniors, affordable housing for all New Yorkers, uh, completely fixing NYCHA, developments, uh, if we recovered that $1.6 billion, we could actually just fix all the NYCHA developments without having to do infill or other things. Uh, we're left fighting the $17 billion. <laughs> well, we're about to get $1.6 billion, hopefully. Uh, the bills are voting on today are part of a package of legislation designed to address this issue, which includes introduction 806B, which was uh, voted out of the Committee on Finance. That bill, sponsored by my colleague, Council Member Julissa Ferreras Copeland, would authorize the Department of Finance to institute a temporary 90-day amnesty program in fiscal year 2017 to resolve outstanding judgments on environmental control board summonses. The debt issue was raised by myself and Council Member Ferreras Copeland during a joint budget hearing of our committees in May of 2014. That hearing was followed by a June 2014 Department of Finance report, which provided the basis for the legislation being voted on today and Local Law 11 of 2015, sponsored by Council Member Ferreras Copeland and myself, which required reporting on ECB violations by Department of Finance. This first report under the local law was issued in November of 2015, and its funding, findings further supported the need for more reform legislation. An interesting finding in the report was that 78% of the summonses resulting in outstanding debt were issued by the Department of Sanitation, and 55% of the total outstanding debt resulted from summonses issued by the Department of Buildings. The two main problems we learned throughout this process is that summons, some summonses contain information that's insufficient to find the responsible party, and that once a judgment has been rendered, agencies are not using the authority they already have to compel people to pay the fines they accrued. Introduction 807A, sponsored by Council Member Ferreras Copeland, myself, and Council Member Dickens, and introduction 812A, sponsored by myself, Council Member Ferreras Copeland, and Gentile, Gentili, addressed the first issue of insufficient information. 807A requires agencies and DOF to make reasonable efforts to learn a respondent's name where a notice of violation has been issued generically to the owner of a business, organization, or premises. The bill would prevent such generic notices from being subject to dismissal and would aid the Department of Finance in its collection efforts. If we know the name, DOF has an actual person they can contact and follow up with and much better opportunity to collect outstanding fines. A12A requires issuing agencies to include the borough block and lot number, including building information number or device identification number on notices of violation related to buildings or lots, providing additional unique identification. Having greater specificity in the location a violation has alleged to have occurred will greatly reduce the number of notices of violation dismissed at a hearing for being the wrong building or a typo in the address. address. Introduction 810A, which I'm proud to sponsor with Council Member Gentili, addresses the second issue I mentioned, which is that agencies are either unaware that they have certain powers or are unwilling to exercise them in order to compel payment of penalties. 810A requires agencies to create a process to deny, suspend, or revoke new and renewal applications for licenses and permits and registrations and report on such occurrences. This will send a powerful message that the city takes enforcement seriously and will incentivize respondents to pay outstanding environmental control board debt. As part of this rules process, agencies will consider certain factors, including whether a respondent has other debt owed to the city, the amount of outstanding environmental control board debt owed, whether the underlying violation has been based on a default, and whether the violation was one in a series of repeated offenses. Knowing that agencies have a process like this in place will greatly incentivize respondents to either pay their outstanding debt immediately or enter into a payment plan with Department of Finance. These are important pieces of legislation that, along with 806B, will improve quality of life enforcement. 
Passing these bills will not only improve this city collections effort, but will more importantly change the behaviors that harm quality of life and jeopardize public health and safety. And to just take it down to what we all deal with every day, every single one of these people at our table and every single council member gets calls every day about specific uh, businesses or residents in their community that are bad neighbors and uh, may or may not be engaging in behaviors that are harming quality of life. And so these environmental control board violations are written over and over again and often result in no change in behavior. Many people aren't paying them. Sometimes they just pay them as a cost of doing business. Either way, all of that is about to change. Uh, Council Member Gentile, did you want to uh, make a statement on any of the legislation? Um, I, I, I think I'd ask the, uh, the witness uh, question when, when they get up. Okay. Thank you. Um, I actually had a question on PMMR, so uh, we'll just take the one. Okay. Uh, hearing no questions and no testimony on uh, these bills, I now ask uh, Committee Clerk uh, William Martin to call the roll. William Martin, Committee Clerk, roll call vote Committee on Governmental Operations. Chair Kalos. Aye on all. Menchaca. Aye on all. And uh, I feel, thank you for making us feel welcomed as we uh, just join the uh, Government Ops Committee. Reynoso. Uh, we're also the youngest committee, I think, in the City Council at this point, um, and I also vote aye on all. Torres. As the youngest of the young, <laughs> aye on all. Borelli. We're also the handsomest, I think, too. <laughs> aye on all. I vote a five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstention. Item, the items have been adopted. I, I have just learned that I am the oldest member of this committee. Thirty-five. Wow. Uh, we will leave the uh, roll open. Uh, we will now move on to the second piece of this hearing, which is on the preliminary mayor's management report, uh, also known as the PMR. We'll be. Today marks the third hearing and this committee has held specifically on the structure of the plenary mayor's management report and the mayor's management report. Uh, these reports provide a biannual public report card on city government and they are critical tools for the council as well as the public to evaluate the performance of city agencies and hold government accountable. As mandated by the charter, the council holds yearly hearings with each agency to discuss the PMR and to make recommendations for changes to the manner in which agencies measure and report their performance data prior to the release of the mayor's management report. In recent years, including most recently this past December, this committee has held oversight hearings concerning structural issues with the PMMR and MMR, which have resulted in several improvements to the publication. I want to particularly note that the mayor's office of operations, who is here today to testify, made several improvements and clarifications in the short term time between our December hearing and when the PMMR was published, and we want to acknowledge and thank them for those efforts. Although the committee is pleased that some of the improvements have been made, our review of the most recent PMMR suggests that further changes could make both of these publications more helpful tools for the council, the public, as well as the agency. At today's hearing, we expect to gain further clarity on the process by which the PMMR is compiled, including how agencies and the mayor's office of operations define indicators and set targets, what steps are taken to ensure that the data reported is accurate, how the data is set forth and the PMR is utilized by agencies to improve their performance and the process through which structural changes are made to the reports. We'll examine whether the PMMR is currently meeting charter mandates and explore whether further improvements can be adopted to make future editions of the PMR and MMR more useful publications. Before we begin, I'd like to thank committee council, uh, Smita Deshmukh, uh, policy analyst, Lori Wen, finance analyst James Sabuti and my legislative director, Paul Westrick, for their work on today's hearing. With that said, I'm going to call up representatives from the administration as our first panel. 
I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify to please fill out a card with uh, the sergeant at arms. I'll ask those on, uh, if, if uh, Mindy Tarlow and Tina Chu from the Mayor's Office of Operations could please join us. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' uh, questions? I do. I do. Uh, please state your name and title and begin when you're ready. I'm uh, Mindy Tarlow. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, and good afternoon. Chairman Kalos and other members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I'm joined by Tina Chu, the Deputy Director for Performance Management, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to discuss the preliminary Mayor's Management Report with you. Um, I did submit detailed testimony. I will dispense with the history of the MMR. I'm sure you're all disappointed. Um, and go right into uh, the sort of more meat of the testimony we're here to discuss today. The main production process of each MMR slash PMMR is six to eight weeks long and requires the efforts of over 10 operations staff members as well as roughly 150 senior staff in the 44 agencies and organizations included in the report as well as deputy mayors and staff who all contribute to the document. Agencies are responsible for timely submissions of draft report chapters for responding quickly to questions and suggestions, and for verifying the final version of their report sections. Operations is responsible for formatting, analyzing, circulating draft sections, for ensuring that narrative explanations are informative, for collecting and responding to reviews of the draft sections, for preparing and producing the published report, and for coordinating with senior city hall officials on the public release and transmittal to the Speaker of the City Council of the MMR and PMMR. The process by which changes are made to an agency's services, goals, indicators, or targets is collaborative and ongoing between operations and the agencies um, and the mayor's office in general, including deputy mayor's offices. The impetus for changes may originate at the agencies or come from within the mayor's office. Operations staff also routinely ask agencies if they expect to make any substantive changes before each production process and agencies put forth proposals. Operations reviews the proposals and there's usually substantial back and forth depending on how extensive the changes are or how well developed the proposals are to begin with. The MMR provides multiple data points and several options to evaluate performance. For each indicator in the MMR, we have three or four elements that provide context. The ways in which the MMR helps the reader evaluate performance include comparisons between the current year and the previous year, also known as year-over-year -year change, comparisons between the desired direction and the year-over-year -year change, comparisons between the desired direction and the five-year trend, and finally, where available, we can compare the current year's actual to that year's numeric or directional target. Generally, we evaluate performance by comparing the current year to date to the previous year to date, which is the same comparison that forms the basis of what we call the continuous improvement model that we use in our citywide performance reporting system, or CPR. We believe, and the document reflects, that this year-over-year -year performance is best evaluated in context with narrative that presents statements about the agency's goals and explanations of changes from year to year. The narrative portion of the MMR and PMMR appears on the first page of every agency section. It is here that the agency's goal statements clearly spell out the specifics of what the agency is working to achieve. Each goal statement is repeated on the pages that follow with specific measurements listed under each statement so the reader can clearly see if the stated goal is being met. 
After our discussion about targets at the hearing in front of this committee in December of 2015, the Office of Operations refined and clarified the explanation of the term target that appears in the PMMR user's guide. In the PMMR for 2016, target was described as, and I'm quoting, desired levels of performance for the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Targets can be numeric or directional. Numeric targets can set an expected level of performance, a maximum level not to be exceeded, or a minimum level to be met. Directional targets are represented by up or down arrows. An asterisk means no numeric or directional target was set, closing quotes. This clarified explanation can be found in the user's guide on page 301 of the PDF version of the PMMR at www.nyc.gov backslash MMR. This explanation will also appear in the fiscal 2016 MMR when it is released in September. Each indicator has attributes or a set of standard characteristics, such as whether or not it is expressed as a percentage or a whole number, whether or not it has a desired direction, and if so, if that direction is up or down. It is important to point out that in the MMR slash PMMR, a target, like a desired direction, is an attribute of an indicator. Targets do not have their own attributes, and so targets do not have desired directions. Targets are generally stable and should not change much from year to year unless there has been a significant shift in priorities, budget, or operations. Although we do not require agencies to set targets for every indicator, generally we prefer that every critical indicator with a desired direction of up or down have a target, either numeric target or an arrow showing the direction in which we want the trend to go, that is a directional target. Generally, we do not recommend setting a numeric target for the number of injuries or the number of fatalities unless that target is set at zero. Generally, we prefer directional targets for injury and fatality indicators. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today on the work of the Mayor's Office of Operations and how we put together the MMR and PMMR. The reports are a product of ongoing collaboration between the Office of Operations and 44 city agencies and partners, and we're very proud of the work we do. We look forward to answering any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, quick testimony. I wanted to uh, just open up by uh, saying thank you for the partnership with the City Council and being re so responsive to uh, the feedback we've provided. So I'd like to turn to page 133 of the uh, PMMR uh, where we have the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and I just wanted to make note of the fact that at page 139, uh, the section on noteworthy changes, additions, or deletions, there's a whole new section, uh, a, a whole two pieces. The first piece is DOHMH corrected the fiscal 2016 targets for infant mortality rate per 1,000 live births and adults aged uh, 50 plus who received a colonoscopy in the past 10 years. So thank you for making that correction. And then uh, perhaps the, the best piece as it goes, uh, DOHMH introduced more ambitious fiscal 2017 targets for the following indicators, children aged 19 and it, it goes on. And as we leaf through the DOHMH <laughs> section for uh, goal 1B, children aged 19 to 35 months with up-to-date immunizations. Uh, the uh, fiscal year uh, 15 actual was 73%. The fiscal year 16 uh, target is 74%. Uh, the fiscal year 17 target is 75%. And uh, it, the targets are headed in the right direction, the actuals are headed in the right direction, and I was incredibly pleased to see this. Uh, this pattern continues through uh, goal 2A, reduce tobacco use and promote physical activity and healthy eating, goal 2B, improving health care, uh, and uh, goal 4A, uh, uh, including the uh, new patients for uh, substance abuse, and uh, so just wanted to thank you because I, I think uh, DOHMH had in a great section. Uh, can you share with us how, uh, how this came to be? When an agency like DOHMH wants to change its indicators, what is the process it uses to make it happen? And uh, 
you could go from there. Well, as I said in my testimony, um, when agencies want to adjust targets or indicators of any sort, there's a pretty robust back and forth um, between the agencies. Uh, Tina can talk more specifically um, about the DOHMH process, and I'll give her an opportunity to do that now and then come back with more general comments. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tina Chu. Um, so in relation to DOHMH targets, I think many of the ones that you identified where there was um, a change uh, in the targets for FY17, some of those were related to work that DOH has done, uh, DOHMH has done around Take Care of New York 2020, which is their sort of overall plan. So they have very specific types of indicators in relation to that plan where they wanted to see performance change. So that helped them think about how they wanted to change the targets for those specific indicators uh, incrementally over these years from FY16 to FY17. So that was something very specific to their process, um, which may not be the usual case for other um, agencies. Yeah, and I think um, just in a general comment, Councilman, you and I have had this conversation, or all three of us have had this conversation before. You know, we, we really um, uh, take care not to take a one-size-fits-all approach to targets and indicators in the PMMR and MMR. Um, we try to see each indicator and each agency as a complex, diverse case that's in some ways reflective of the complex, diverse city that we're monitoring and reporting on. So we try to look at each set of statistics and targets um, and design them to match and balance each agency's diverse goals and directions, which is why we sort of intentionally um, have different ways of looking at target setting across the whole city, again, in collaboration with the agency and others um, at City Hall and other partners. And to the extent that uh, I feel as though DOHMH has been ambitious in their goal setting, uh, what is the process and how can we replicate that throughout other agencies? Yeah, so as I said, you know, um, uh, we too think DOHMH is a, a really good and very um, performance-oriented agency, and I'm sure that they would be thrilled to know that you're recognizing them for that. Um, but as I said, every agency is different. They're all equally um, accountable for their performance, um, but we don't see any one agency as setting a template for how every other agency should act. As I said, uh, each agency is different. Um, they uh, represent a diverse array of metrics and goals. Um, so we uh, purposely have a range of ways that we can look at each agency and each target setting operation and work in collaboration with each agency as we do that. Thank you. I'm going to hold my questions for one moment so that uh, committee clerk uh, William Martin can continue to call the roll. And I'd like to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Mark Levine. Continuation roll call the Committee on Governmental Operations. Council Member Levine. Aye. The vote now stands at six in the affirmative. Thank you. The Progressive Caucus has perfect attendance at the Governmental Operations Committee. <laughs> Continuing uh, with the uh, PMMR, I'd like to narrow down on a different agency. Uh, it's not necessarily an agency, it's actually a subdivision of the Mayor's Office of Operations. So on page 121, uh, we find ourselves looking at the 301 Customer Service Center. As you may or may not know, I'm a huge fan of 301. I advise my constituents to call 301. We actually generate uh, more constituent service 301 uh, complaints on certain complaints in my district than almost anywhere else in the city. And uh, for anyone watching today or online, please download the 301 app on your phone. It is great and it allows you to make some of the 301 complaints that might take uh, several minutes in several seconds, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, homeless outreach, uh, making those calls, and I actually understand that there may be good news there too, uh, can tend to take some time. And I've actually instructed my constituents to how to get through the three operators necessary to make those complaints, but you can just press a button on the 301 app and dispatch homeless outreach, which is great. And also, thank you for all the hard work on Homestat, available at nyc.gov slash Homestat. 
uh, where folks can see on a map where the 301 complaints came from uh, and where the homeless outreach came from and see what's happening on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis. So uh, going a little bit deeper into 301, under uh, goal 1A, one of the critical indicators is average wait time. And I was curious about how that's approached. In fiscal year 13, it was 38 seconds. In fiscal year 14, it was 23 seconds. In fiscal year 15, it was 23 seconds. And fiscal year 16 and 17 has targets set at 30 seconds. And to the extent that a target can be a maximum, a minimum, or an actual desired level of performance, what is this and how does 311, which Mayor's Office of Operations uh, manages, use this critical indicator? So the, the 30 second, um, the indicator of average wait time and the target of 30 seconds um, is an operational metric that's sort of tried and true within the industry. Um, so this performance metric of 30 seconds or less um, is considered something as a maximum level not to be exceeded rather than sort of a bullseye type of target. Um, 311 has to balance you know, staffing and operational issues with the customer's need for a quick and efficient response. So actually stating the 30 second maximum waiting time as or average waiting time as the target helps the customer understand or have an expectation as to what they should be experiencing when they're making their call. Um, but as, it's, as mentioned, um, this does have to be balanced with this notion of the staffing and operational issues. Because if an average wait time goes down below 30 seconds, that could actually trigger um, questions about staffing levels and possible operational changes in relation to that. So that fewer people may be needed to answer calls at a particular time, or people and ships may be rescheduled so that staffing better, need, uh, better meets demand. But um, just to reiterate, you know, staffing to match demand does not mean that wait times should go above 30 seconds. So just understanding that 30 seconds is that sort of maximum level. Uh, another item to just sort of try to clarify is that setting a bullseye target, particularly for something like a call center, could fa be fairly counterproductive. You would have to over-engineer staffing to make a bullseye, considering that you know, the arrival pattern of calls can vary greatly from day to day, season to season, even hour to hour, based on conditions uh, externally, and that could directly uh, impact performance. Thank you. With regard to targets, uh, as you testified and uh, as was noted, the user's guide at page 301 in the PDF uh, has changed uh, with regards to target. And uh, target now can be uh, desired level of performance for the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Targets can be numeric or directional. Targets can be set as the expected level of performance. A maximum level can for a uh, maximum level not to exceed it or a minimum level to be met. And so I am grateful that you've added this clarification, but within this clarification, uh, when I'm looking at an individual number uh, and without narratives explaining each and every indicator, I am concerned that there is now less definition to the indicators because uh, of the breadth of target being that it could be a minimum or a maximum, which are actually opposites. Uh, would you consider uh, adding an attribute or something to help guide users of the PMMR and MMR in future editions so that the target is uh, uh, better defined as maximum, minimum, or expected level? Um, yes. Um, actually, we, we really appreciate the back and forth we've had with you and your team, and um, our goal is for the customer or the reader or consumer of the MMR and PMMR to really understand what they're looking at. Um, we are thinking about ways uh, to do just as you said and make it easier for the reader or consumer to understand what type of target they're looking at, um, because as you said, we've been more clear that they can be multiple things. Um, and as those ideas gel, uh, we're happy to share them with you um, and you know engage in a good back and forth um, to make sure that you as our, one of our best customers, um, uh, uh, really feels confident that the MMR is as transparent and accessible as it can be. 
will always be somewhat constrained. Um, the document itself uh, is a little um, old school. Um, and now that I know that I'm 20 years older than everybody on the committee, <laughs> I think I know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, and but within those designed parameters, um, we're very interested in improving the document. Oh yeah, good thing you came. Uh, so the, the, cal the, the committee and you don't have me beat, believe me. Committee on Governmental Operations is apparently older than uh, members originally <laughs> thought, and uh, Mark Levine might be the oldest member of our committee at. Well, we both at need to respect your elders. Th thank That's you. That's right. Oh, can you say that for the record? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the there, there you go. So I have one last line of questioning before I'll open up to member questions from Council Member Gentili, Council Member Anchaka. Uh, with regard to Department of Homeless Services, uh, at the last hearing, uh, there was a little bit of controversy based on coverage from the New York Post that uh, the indicator for the number of unsheltered individuals would be planned to go up, uh, in exceeding the actual act the, the actuals from the previous year. Uh, in this coming PMMR, that number had been removed, and so. Um, I believe it is performance indicator 4A, unsheltered individuals who are estimated to be living on the street and parks under highways on subways and the public transportation stations in New York City. And uh, it had been estimated to go up from 3,182. Now it is a down arrow um, and was curious why you had changed it. Well, we um, thought it was appropriate for that indicator to be directional. Um, uh, as opposed to an actual number. And as you alluded to before, Councilman, we are doing significant amount of work right now about trying to um, wrap our arms more holistically around the issue of street homelessness. And as you know, that's just barely getting underway. Um, and so we felt it was appropriate to make this target a directional target, which is down, of course. Um, and that is where uh, uh, we felt it was best for it to be for right now. Um, certainly in future years, we can, as things keep going, uh, reconsider how we manage to that. But for now, we've put it as a directional downward target. And so along those lines, the charter at section 12B4 requires, quote, an appendix indicating the relationship between the program performance goals and measures including in the management report pursuant to paragraph two of the subdivision and corresponding appropriations contained in the preliminary budget. And in the citywide uh, multi-agency mayoral priorities, there will be an indication of the city is spending X million dollars to improve this result and we see a desired result hopefully of an additional XYZ, particularly around legal services to prevent uh, evictions. We're spending however many million dollars to prevent however many thousands of evictions and along the same lines uh, impact homelessness. So uh, is there an ability in the agencies like DHS, we have this huge multi-agency effort and Homestat that's launched, uh, wouldn't it be appropriate and within the charter mandate to have the performance budgeting and performance metrics to say, as a city we're spending $100 million and as a result, rather than a downward direction, we're hoping to have the number of homeless and unsheltered on our streets. So we are working with OMB. We're in conversations with them on ways that we can line up functional spending with performance indicators throughout the year. Um, right now, OMB's functional budget links to the PMMR, and we're going to cross-link the PMMR to the functional budget so it's more accessible for the user. Um, uh, so we can do that uh, right away and in our next issuance. Um, but overall, you know, operations in OMB are committed to exploring more ways that we can cross-reference the data that we both have. Um, to make it more available and more timely. Um, but that's a discussion that is underway with OMB now. Thank you. With regard to the functional budget analysis, that tends to break things down. So DHS would be broken down between shelter services and unsheltered outreach services, but it doesn't provide the performance 
budgeting, which I think is important. So I'm grateful that hopefully we will see this cross-linking, but eager to move towards performance budgeting. We are joined by uh, Council Member Greenfield, and we will uh, call, I uh, instruct the committee clerk to uh, call the roll, uh, followed by questions from Council Member Gentili, Menchaca, and Levine. Continuation roll call, Committee on Governmental Operations. Council Member Greenfield. Aye and all. Final vote now stands at a six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. And, and for the record, I just made Council Member Greenfield wait 45 minutes to vote, um, which was apparently a topic of uh, tw Twitter worthiness at a-, a Should see how long he makes me to, makes me wait to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Only 45 uh, minutes to vote. If you want to speak, it's like an hour and a half. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Gentile. Well, my wait time was very, very quick, so thank you, Council, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Director Tarlow, thank you for being here. Uh, Ms. Chu, thank you for uh, being here. And I thank you for inviting me to come to ask a question. As you know, uh, as you might not know, I, I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. And in that role, uh, we, um, we have the Department of Investigation come in uh, during the uh, preliminary budget and executive budget uh, hearings. And it's, it's a budget uh, slash PMMR um, hearing that we have with DOI. And one of the issues that always comes up at these hearings um, when we talk about the PMMR particularly is the fact that um, when you look at the inspector general offices mm -hmm. under DOI, particularly for Department of Corrections mm -hmm. and the NYP, NYPD IG, mm -hmm. um, there are no indicators in the PMMR that would lead us to evaluate any of their performances, the no numeric targets, the no numeric targets. There's really nothing that, that is provided in the PMMR that would be helpful in evaluating the performance of, of, the those, of those individual IGs, IGs, particularly in Department of Corrections and in the NYPD. So I'm curious, since, since you say the impetus for change may originate either from your office or from the agencies, whether or not you've had this discussion with them and whether there is some thought about changing that as we've been asking for. Um, I have not engaged in conversation with DOI on that topic. Um, we can certainly raise it with them um, and come back around to you. Uh, can you be more specific about the kinds of targets that you're looking for? That's the only thing that, you know, um, it's hard to have like a target for a number of investigations you want to launch because it's so dependent on what's happening within the given agencies. Is it a time to close? Is it a- uh, Yes, I was typical of the other quantifiers mm -hmm. that are in the, um, in the rest of the DOI report. Um, as, as uh, Commissioner Peters testifies to about the agency overall, mm -hmm. but when it gets down to the issue of the IG, mm -hmm. there are no quantifiers as to the work that they specifically are doing. There's an overall, how many cases have been closed, how many arrests yes, have been made, yes, yes. but nothing individually by the IGs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. So we can certainly discuss that with the department, um, and we can come back around with a joint response. Did you want to add anything? And, and certainly, I was going to ask you if you knew, uh, if you thought of any quantifiers that should be should be in those types of reports too. Um, I think that. Uh, investigations of that type can be tricky to, um, not tricky to measure, but tricky to put targets around and things like that, right? Because you don't, um, you're really just responding to um, real life um, instead of saying we should have five of these right. and no, ten no. of these. Right, no, no, and we're not saying and it the, could be, but, but the, I think the comparative. And then there's the complexity and all of but that. But comparative from one year to the next mm -hmm. is, is really is really the, the Just value. Just reporting on the raw data. Uh, right, mm -hmm. right. I, I'm not suggesting that they have particular targets unless yeah. it's appropriate, unless it's right. appropriate. Right, right. But if, if the, you have the comparative year to year, mm -hmm. at least you can ask questions mm -hmm. about the comparative numbers from year to year. Understood. Thank you. Great, okay. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, again, thank you for inviting me. I, I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Councilmember Benchaka, followed by Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for, for coming and talking about this uh, very, very important and kind of critical uh, uh, document for our New Yorkers. And what I wanted to do is just kind of ask a little bit about some of the table of contents on the report and how you develop the different sections. Uh, kind of basic stuff, but I want to start there before I get into some more specific pieces. And uh, how, how do you define uh, under, the, uh, under the PMMR and the MMR uh, what agencies end up here? Can you, tell, can you tell us and New Yorkers out there how, how that gets defined mm -hmm. for us? Yes, actually, it's in the written testimony. I spared some of that history. Um, there are 44 mayoral agencies um, that are all. Uh, uh, and does that include mayor's offices of? The you're asking about people uh, like the mayor's office of operations Correct. or Moya, Moya or something like that. No, I'm, actually, I'm headed the, to Moya in a little I, bit. I, I know. <laughs> I have the page marked as soon as I nice. saw you. Um, uh, uh, no, the mayor's office proper and the policy offices within the mayor's office are not part of the agency by agency um, uh, monitoring that we do. However, um, we have many uh, sections up front um, about agencies working together and collaborating, which often include one or more mayor offices. Um, so the, the uh, the MMR and PMMR cover the operations of city agencies that report directly to the mayor. Those are agencies that report directly to the mayor. And then three additional non-mayoral agencies are included. I think that's NYCHA, Health and Hospitals. And elections? It's um, Board of Elections, Public Libraries, and oh, uh, CUNY. CUNY, OK. I had it all wrong. Um, uh, and that's what we report on, that equals 44 agencies. And again, uh, as in past history um, and picked up by this administration, we also have several multi-agency initiatives that work across the city um, that can include one or more of the mayor's offices. And, and tell us about the, the kind of evolving nature of the, uh, the, the different agencies that get up on, on with, within the focus areas of the indicators and how that could change in the future. If you wanted to bring in new agencies or, because you have three that are not mayoral agencies but landed on there, tell us a little bit about, about how we can add new, new content areas for review. I'm actually not sure Okay. Um, what the process would be to add an agency to the MMR. Um, I don't know if there's a specific process that we would have to go through. Um, um, I do know uh, that we've gotten more and more interested in reporting on multi-agency That's where I'm headed to. Um, Great. Because we really uh, feel that the work that we're doing across domains um, is some of the most important work that the city does, whether it's pre-K or whether it's Vision Zero or whether it's um, um, career pathways. And those are the sections that you see in the front of the document um, um, about like sort of collaborating to deliver results. There are numerous sections and we change them over time. We don't want it to get stale or, you know, uh, we want to add things as we go. And there we've had a lot of flexibility and I think it's noticeable. Well, and, and let's just go, let's just dive deep into that concept of really kind of combining multi-agency approaches to one constituency or one kind of policy area. I think this administration has done a great job of kind of elevating certain certain kind of pieces, and I'll stick to, say, immigrants in our city. Um, IDNYC uh, has been something that you have poured your heart and soul into and have seen just a tremendous amount of, of impact in our communities. And, what, and, and we just, uh, a week and some ago had our first uh, preliminary budget hearing on on immigrants and how the budget is affecting the our immigrant community and how can we work together to really kind of elevate that mm -hmm. through multiple agencies in its own section and kind of see how perform and, and really understand the performance indicators 
for our immigrant, immigrant community across agencies. Is that something that you're prepared to kind of work with us and this committee and the chair um, and the council? Well, I think IDNYC is a great example of that. In fact, IDNYC had its own upfront section right. about collaborating to deliver results because as you know as well as I do, it took a lot of people to pull together to make that initiative work. Now, some you know, 14 months later, it's actually so established that the indicators associated with IDNYC are actually now in the HRA section. Um, that's the cycle of life right. <laughs> of a performance indicator. And in fact, I think I even referenced that in the cover letter to this PMMR. Like, that's what we want, to really feature a multi-agency new initiative and then have it be so routine um, that it becomes baked into the fabric of what we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think IDNYC is both a terrific example of that, but also a terrific example, albeit a very specific one, of how the city came together to focus on a specific initiative uh, mostly targeted towards immigrant populations and really highlight, highlighted that and then had sort of numbers and goals attached to it so that we could really show ourselves and the public that we're making progress. And, and let, let's, let's take this offline and work together to figure out how we can, how we can do more of that work and, and really kind of capture it in a, in a focused, focused way uh, and bake it in for the future. And, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, machine readable formats and mm -hmm. 2014, 2015. I know the chair has been kind of pushing this and so we want to thank the chair for his advocacy. Um, are there any plans to go post-2014 uh, post or I should say pre-2014 and kind of thinking about other, other years in historical data uh, for us to be able to, and, and for our public to be able to analyze? So are you asking if we can, because uh, the documents are now on the open data portal. Right. Um, so you're asking if can we go backwards. Back, beyond, beyond 2014. And, and what, what, what the constraints, hurdles, um, or even opportunities that you're seeing in doing that? So we've been in conversation with Do It. Um, they're interested, obviously, in getting more of the historical data in there. And we know that the public and users would appreciate that as well. So we're trying to deal with, the, as you might imagine, some technical wrinkles and challenges with you know, a lot of data points, things that change over time, making sure that we are able to get the information sort of consistently rendered. So we are working with them on that. Any, any sense of timeline or, or uh, we're in the middle of budget season, so it'd be great to kind of understand if there's any kind of budget constraints to this topic or really is, it's really a, just a matter of kind of political will. What, what's the timeline? I don't have one offhand to give to you right now, but we are working on that. And we know that with the MMR coming up and preparations for that, we would want to make sure that if we have, we're definitely going to have the FY16 MMR information right. available, and we want to see how much we can also provide during that time frame. Can we expect maybe one year uh, to come out, uh, 2013? Is that possible? Um, I guess one of, the, one of the questions is how much we want sort of distinct files versus files where the records are continuous over time. Um, we could probably do an easier job of using the snapshot data from a prior year and putting that up on open data, but to make sure that we have everything linked properly for multiple years, um, I, we will want, we'll try to do that, but I, I can't state for certain whether we'll get that up and running. And final question, um, have you engaged the uh, the open source community. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there that have been using this data uh, and really kind of bringing up some really great analysis. Have you asked them what, what this question that you just brought to us uh, on whether or not you go one way or another, have you, have you engaged them in an in a organized fashion in asking them what they want, what they need, and how they need it? Um, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics is also uh, part of uh, our umbrella. Um, and they have a, an active relationship with the civic tech community and engage with them very directly um, on numerous topics. And if they haven't addressed this one directly, we can certainly make sure that happens. Great, wonderful. Well, looking forward to, to continuing these conversations. Uh, f full disclosure, uh, 
Carlos does not have a full arm's length relationship with Ben Wallington behind iQuant New York. Uh, and that is probably the source of many of these questions and great questions. Uh, w one piece I will just m note is uh, these are great questions. However, I am curious about how we get clip art into the open data platform. And I do thank you for the upgrades to the MMR since the Giuliani era arrows with clop clip art and bar graphs. <laughs> Uh, it is much more usable and actually members of the public and uh, in general you can visit and you can read up to 1997 on the nyc.gov slash MMR site or you can even visit the city records Doris for going back as far as 1977 for those of you who are having trouble sleeping. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Levine. Thank you Mr. Chair. Wonderful to see both of you. Thank you. I want to start with a few questions related to the Parks Department. Um, you have an important metric, which is the, uh, a, it's a measure of the cleanliness and maintenance of parks. I'm going to find it in one second. Uh, parks rated acceptable for overall conditions. It's, uh, it's your top line measure for the department. Uh, and FY14, that was 87%. One page 104, in case that helps. And FY15 dropped a little bit to 86%. And so far, in the first four months of FY16, it's down to 85%. Now, those are not major declines, but that may be the measure which affects park users most directly, probably the one that the public is most sensitive to, most affects the park experience. Um, I think to say that it's plateaued is the minimum we can say, and perhaps there's even a statistically significant decline. Um, I'm wondering if you have an explanation for that uh, and if you can tie it in any way to recent budget decisions for the department. Um, don't have an answer on whether there's specific budget uh, connection to the metric. I think that uh, what you stated is, is probably fair, that it's kind of at a steady state, like those numbers are actually very close together. Um, I think that, you know, the Parks Department always strives uh, to do better. I think you're right that it is one of the signature things that parks are standards that they're held to. Um, we can find out specific, more specific information about uh, anything that's um, co of a concern to the department, and we can yeah. certainly circle back. Well, so the goal is 85%, so you're, you're at the goal, uh, which is good. But, you know, if you happen to be in one of the 15% of parks which is on the negative end of this, um, it's still an unsatisfactory experience. Right, and I think the Community Parks Initiative, um, uh, you know, that's, that's trying to focus on parks that are, uh, have had less attention over the decades. Um, I certainly think that Commissioner Silver and his team are trying to create the most equitable um, park system that's available. F fair enough, and he, he's, he's absolutely committed to that, and, and we love CPI for sure. Why not make the goal 90% of parks meeting the standards, or 95, or even higher? Well, I think that gets to the overall question about target setting, um, and they can vary for different reasons. Um, sometimes it's just the it can be a budget issue that you know the the amount of investment that would be required just to get from 85 to 88, and I'm just uh, being illustrative here, yeah. um, could be so significant. Um, and take away from other things that might be equally important, whether within an agency or across agencies, that can be one reason. Um, another uh, reason could be, as Tina was describing with 311, you're always balancing within the agency. If I do more of this, then I'm gonna do less of that, and how do I make sure that on balance, I'm meeting all the demands that I have? So I think the target setting generally uh, is in that uh, yeah, yes, look, as, you, as you're, you're probably aware, um, the mayor's budget for the Parks Department called for laying off 150 uh, staff members, 100 maintenance workers and 50 gardeners. Um, to me, to see these statistics makes that proposal uh, even less easy, even more <laughs> difficult to understand, frankly. Um, at a time when we're at best holding even on maintenance levels, um, and even that's leaving 15% of the parks out, uh, to be cutting the frontline staff involved in maintenance 
to me, doesn't make sense. It's something that I'm pushing very hard to reverse, as, as you may know. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing a measure here on park safety, um, although I may have missed it. Yeah, there are... Um, Sorry. If you look at goal 1B on page 105, you uh, can yes. see the major felonies in the 30 largest parks and the crimes against property. Got it. So we've now, we're now tracking safety and in, in, uh, you're reporting park by park public safety numbers for the top 100 parks, right? Um, this was the council legislation which phased in reporting on a park by park basis. Uh, the first uh, phase of that required reporting for 30 parks. We're now going to be, we're now, you are now already reporting on the top 100 parks. So can we presume that we'll see data on the top 100 parks coming soon? We'll talk about that with the Parks Department. You know, we're in the process right now of, you know, working for preparation for the MMR. So this is a good opportunity for us to have that discussion. Okay. If, if I recall correctly, having seen the numbers, um, property crimes are up if you look at the top 100 parks. Um, these are things like thefts of smartphones, et cetera. Uh, thankfully, not violent crimes. I believe violent crime is down for the, even the broader pool of parks. But clearly, there's something going on with... Um, with nonviolent crime, property crime that, that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. On the capital front, um, sorry, let me note and give you credit for one important thing here, since <laughs> I'm giving you a hard time on other items. Uh, the mayor's budget did include funding for, I believe, 67 uh, PEP officers, park enforcement personnel, um, which, which I certainly cheer. And it's something I hear from park users all the time. Uh, they want more PEP officers. Undoubtedly, it's a deterrent to the kind of property crime that we're referring to now. So kudos to you all for that. Thank you. On the capital front, um, you've got a goal that, uh, 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 that, that measures how many New Yorkers live within walking distance of a park. And I don't know if you define that as five blocks or 10 blocks. In distant co different contexts, I've heard it both ways. Do you happen to know off the top of your head? I think it's. Um, I, I think that might be the 10 block yeah, definition. Yeah, I think but it's a quarter mile or a half ah. mile, which is the five block, 10 block Got it. Um, difference. And I'm so focused on 1NYC, which we're preparing the progress report for, that I'm not sure if it's the same or different. Do you know? So that means it's five. I think it's a quarter mile. I'm pretty sure. OK, great. That's good news. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in the plan YC, the predecessor document, there actually was a target for this measure. I think it was 90%. We should look that up. Um, you're, you don't have a target listed here at all on this measure. Is that because it was taken out of 1NYC? Uh, I believe there is a target in 1NYC, um, and I can come back to you about that. OK. I would think that if it's in 1NYC, it would be in this report as well. Yeah. OK, got it. Um, <coughs> You have measures for the timeliness in completion of capital projects, um, but there's something strange happening here. You're, 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 of course, measuring the percent of capital projects which come in on time, but you know, if a project's budgeted for five years or planned for five years to renovate a dog run, uh, you may be able to declare victory that you did it in five years, but to constituents uh, who are left fuming that it took five years to do the dog run, hard to call that a success. It seems to me you need a measure that simply ask how long is it taking us to do capital projects? Maybe you categorize them by s the size, but that's what impacts park users. How long do they have to wait for the comfort station to get fixed? And we've known historically, anecdotally, um, the answer is often many years, um, typically three or four years, certainly cases that are beyond that, even for projects which on the surface of fear appear to be relatively modest. So I think it would be very pow powerful to say, we want the average uh, parks capital project to be done in 30 months. Uh, we could talk about what the right measure is, but uh, as you well know, once you begin to track something like that, it motivates behavior. And uh, because the commissioner, Commissioner Silver, has brought a, a wealth of information online through the parks capital yes. tracker, uh, we know that the systems to measure that are in place, and the public can see that. 
but to aggregate it towards a goal would be very powerful. Yeah, and I think uh, much like with the performance measures overall, um, there are distinctions. One project's not like another project, and so it's hard to have one standard, if you will, um, uh, similar to the comments uh, in the back and forth Councilman Kalos and I were having earlier. But yes, Parks has done a terrific job of putting their tracker online. Um, there is also a capital projects dashboard um, that's on the operations website, which is for larger projects of 25 million or more. Right, well, right. Okay, well, so you could have a threshold above or below of which you, you, you either don't track or put in a different category. I understand that some projects um, are special cases, but but the bulk of them are between, say, a million and 10 million, and there it seems to me there'd be a reasonable comparison if we could track in that way. Again, I mean, I, I don't want to answer off the top of my head into a microphone, um, uh, but I do think I'd have to really give that some thought, and also the ca whole capital process is a little bit beyond um, what the Office of Operations is doing in its performance management, um, but I, I do think that performance measures um, are in some ways designed to be diverse and um, uh, particular to a given set of things. So I don't think you could really have one standard, even if it was just for anything under 10 million, we're gonna complete it in X amount of time. Okay. Um, but I understand your point. Yep. Okay, I do want, if the chair will allow, I, I wanna just quickly ask you about one other agency. Um, please give me the signal when it's time. Or do you want me to come back for a second round, Chair? I'll take as Thank much you, time as you like. Thank you. No, no. Um, so uh, much to the credit of the administration, and I'm proud that the council has really partnered in this, we have dramatically increased um, our eviction prevention efforts through providing legal services to tenants in housing court. Um, two fiscal years ago, the city, all the funding together, what the council provided administration was $6 million towards this effort. Um, it's, it's, I believe, approaching $70 million now, That's right. and existing commitments uh, are going to take it even farther. Um, I happen to be pushing to get to the day when we have uh, universal representation for tenants in housing court. Um, but in the meantime, it seems like there's a lot to talk about um, in, in just what kind of impact this work is having, because we have just steered dramatic amounts of resources into this important work. Um, I was looking through the HRA chapter, and I didn't see this explicitly addressed. Um, you know, we created a new office of civil justice, which would strike me would warrant its own category. Uh, it's also overseeing provision of services to um, immigrants in immigration court, uh, family court, and other contexts. Um, I think uh, one thing I would say is I think you are aware that we've been doing a pretty substantial review over, there was a 90-day review and many, many reforms that have been already announced <coughs> and more that are coming. Um, and I think that that review will be announced in the coming days or weeks. And I think there will be a lot of information in there, um, some of which is related to uh, issues that we've announced to date like what we've been doing on evictions, but I actually thought we had something in here. Um, in the, yes, on page seven, um, this was one of the more collaborative initiatives. Um, is, so in the housing New York section, I think you can see city funded legal services programs in the HRA budget total 34 million uh, on page seven. Uh, it's the yeah. paragraph right before refining city financing tools. Great. Good to see it in there. I can think of uh, a number of metrics beyond just how much we're spending. Of um, and there's always a tension between measuring outputs and results. Uh, if you want to measure results, let's talk about how many evictions there are in the city. And there, there's some great news that we should be touting as much as possible. The number of evictions is down over the last two years since we began to ramp up the spending. It's down 25%. Uh, re really uh, amazing results uh, for such a short period of time. Uh, and uh, we could also measure things like uh, 
number, a portion of tenants that have legal representation. Uh, these are not entirely in the control of the city. I understand that because there's many factors that determine uh, just how many. Uh, just how, sorry, I think I misquoted the number previously. It's down 17% in the last two years, which is great news. I want to get that right, right for the record. Um, yes, there are many factors that contribute to that drop, some of which are directly attributable to city's efforts and could be some market changes as, as well. But, you know, we track crime. I'm sure crime is, is well covered in the MMR. Uh, and there again, it's largely due to policies that are carried out by the city, but there are broader societal factors as well. Mm -hmm. So doesn't strike me that there's any reason that we couldn't measure things like number of evictions, portion of tenants which have, have representation. Do those strike you as reasonable measures? I think it's uh, always important to make sure that the data is readily available. That's one of the big issues about putting indicators in the MMR. Um, Commissioner Banks um, is uh, one of the very active uh, commissioners in terms of talking about indicators and taking this kind of document really seriously. Um, I think know that the investments in the anti-eviction initiatives are very uh, recent. Um, so obviously it takes time to really start to lay out, even if it's just interim outcomes. Um, and uh, uh, we can certainly talk with and work with Commissioner Banks and his team about how we might present this information, whether it continues to be in an upfront collaborative section around housing and related issues, or whether, like with IDNYC, it becomes um, systematized enough that we can put it in as a regular indicators in HRA. Um, we're happy to discuss that with them. And if there's time to do something for September, um, we can look at that. It might take us longer, again, for to see um, some of the impact of the work. Um, we like to make sure that things are um, baked uh, before putting it in, you know, such an official annual or yeah. semi-annual document. Correct. Just, just the last point I'll make is that there, there's a, a wide range of availability of this data, depending mm -hmm. on what we want to look at. Great. The number of evictions is tracked by the, US, by, the, by the city marshals precisely down to the exact number. Uh, so that's how we know with great certainty um, the pace at which the number of evictions is dropping. Um, the question of just what portion of tenants have representation is more elusive. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of a perfect data set on that. Uh, we have estimates from advocates who are in the courts every day that, that say that uh, prior to this round of investing resources, it was probably less than 10% of tenants, and that today we're probably more like 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. But those are not precise measures. Um, it's great that we now have a civil justice coordinator uh, at HRA. Um, Jordan Dressler is off to a great start. He's going to be a huge asset to us. And I think that one of the things he's working intensely on is, is just how to get more exact data on any of these things. And I would hope that as we can, it begins to make its way into these uh, important mm -hmm. MMR documents. Well, we'd be very happy to partner with them on that. Great. Thank you, and thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. No worries. Uh, with regard to the Office of Court Administration, feel free to reach out to them. The database that they use for managing cases includes the party names and whether or not they're represented and the uh, councils that are representing. So when somebody is pro se, they appear without counsel and there's usually five dashes. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of querying the OCA database for all the housing court cases that lack a uh, attorney on the defense side. That is an outstanding idea. We're going to get right on it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You got it. Uh, for second round, to Carlos Menchaca for a question, and then I will continue with second round. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I wanted just to ask a little bit about language access to the report and um, what you do today to bring the report in multiple languages out into the community. Is a report written in other languages? How do you get it out oh. to the asking whether this is available in other languages? Is this languages? available in other languages? And how, and how do you disseminate the report in other languages? I actually don't know. I'm sorry. OK. Uh, well, the two questions. So you don't know if, if, you, if we print this in other languages? I don't think we print hard copy in another language. 
do you have any digital digital formats for other languages? No. Okay. Uh, and it'd be great to work together on uh, this committee and, and the council to figure out how we can how we can do that and identify resources to to get this information out into into the community. This is incredibly valuable information. Mm -hmm. Um, that we've already just in this one hearing spoke to and would be great to get this out into into the hands of our of our immigrant community. Uh, that's it. Thank you so great. much. Thank you. Thank you and thank you to all the members for uh, participating in a uh, strong hearing. On second round I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. I oversee the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. In the Mayor's Management Report, the narrative for the goal of, quote, reducing the city's energy-related carbon footprint, quote, states that, quote, DCAS is reviewing its indicators in fiscal 2016 to better capture progress of the programs, period, end quote. I see that the indicators in the PMR regarding energy have not changed, um, and there are a lot of times where I will bring things up to a commissioner and even the, uh, as seen, the MMR will reflect that they're seeking to change it. Um, just ha had a couple of open-ended questions along the lines of once published, how, so I guess along those lines, who has ultimate responsibility for the changes that are being implemented? Is it with the agency or operations? And how do those changes actually end up happening? Like, how do we make this change happen as it was promised? Well, as I, testified earlier and in response to a couple of earlier questions. It's a very collaborative process. Um, we don't dictate play to the agencies and the agencies um, don't just unilaterally make changes. Um, it's a collaborative um, back and forth that's generally pretty substantive. Um, with respect to the energy indicators, as you know, um, there's a new commissioner at DCAS. Um, haven't had a chance to meet with Commissioner Camillo in her new capacity. Um, and we will be doing that as we head towards the September MMR. So yes, we, we had a changeover in the commissioners, which helps explains why something that was planned in the MMR and written in the MMR didn't happen in the PMR, I guess. The question of frustration for council members is just uh, figuring out where, where the buck stops, who has ultimate responsibility, so that if we want a indicator change, does that mean that we ask at the PMMR and budget hearing, and then we send a separate letter to operations or what is what is the recommended way that we actually make sure that when there seems to be consensus from coming out of a PMMR hearing that it actually does change. Right. So um, as you could tell from the discussion just here, there's a lot of um, steps along the process after a particular proposal for an indicator is made. So although there may be a general consensus agreement or uh, understanding about the, um, uh, whether or not an indicator might be a good idea to change or to add um, to the PMMR or the MMR, uh, in the discussions afterwards is where we really have to look through a number of different criteria as to whether we can actually go through with those types of edits or changes. So in those discussions, it may be the case that it doesn't necessarily fit within the guidelines of the way the MMR is established, whether it's in the service or goal setup, whether it's related to whether the data is actually available or of good quality, or um, perhaps there are other sort of factors or issues that sort of make it not the most useful indicator or most useful type of um, target to include. So I think that this as a generative area for uh, ideas and proposals to come up is very useful and we have been um, listening on conversations and following up um, to hear what those ideas are, but it's sort of taking it into the back room and making sure that when we work on it more fully, it is consistent with what we need to have within the document. I think to the extent some sort of informal or formal procedure of something gets flagged at a PMR preliminary budget or even executive budget hearing, but I think it's just PMR and preliminary budget where things are heard together, 
so that when something comes up and whether the agency brings it to you or intergovernmental affairs from the mayors brings it to you or committee councils from the city council brings it to you, just making sure that you're in the loop and uh, we don't end up in situations where a council member asks somebody to fix something, the commissioner agrees or says, yes, we'll get right back to you. And then the way we hear back about it is we open the MMR and something hasn't changed. So whatever we can do to make sure that there is a step in between the request and the MMR. Uh, one piece I wanted to just seek additional clarification on is uh, occasionally you will have a, a target and that direct target may be numerical or directional and occasionally you will use an asterisk and uh, that is defined within the document in multiple places as no target. How do you make the decision between directional and no target with regain, with, with in the targets and sometimes we will get an asterisk which means no target at the same time as there's a desired direction uh, that is in a direction so I guess one question being shouldn't we when we have a direct desired direction shouldn't that also just be directional arrows versus asterisks um, how do we get rid of the asterisks or what are they there for so the so your question is, if, so the asterisks def definitely mean that there is no particular target set out there. Desired directions tell us where we want to see the actuals move from year to year. Um, and you're asking whether in the case when we have a desired direction, um, whether the target, rather than having an asterisk, should have the same direction as desired direction? That's correct. Um, we'd have to look at that sort of case by case again. So, um, and again, the targets, so, the so attributes of, of desired, desired direction is an attribute of the indicator rather than of the target itself. Um, so that's probably why you're seeing that difference. So uh, the example that we have is on page 76 for the law department, goal 1A, total citywide payout for judgments and claims. Uh, the FY16 and FY17 show a down arrow, but for total cases commenced against the city, the target shows an asterisk. Oh, I'm sorry, can you just be more specific about where you are? Uh, page 76, oh, goal mm -hmm. 1A. So payouts for judgments and claims, again, I'd prefer to see numerical, but at least there is a down arrow. But for total cases commenced against the city, there's an asterisk. If you could explain the distinction and why we get an asterisk there instead of a down arrow. Yeah, I think that this falls generally into a more sort of neutral category where if we can't control what comes in from outside, um, we can't say uh, it's sort of um, like some population metrics are also neutral, right? We can't control what's coming in from the outside, but once we have it, we can try to control the um, uh, payout or the sort of, you know, what the city's held accountable for. I would say it's something in that rubric. Uh, so I think that, so I gather that part of the PMMR is not only for management, but just for tracking of tra tracking trends. So to the extent that is able to split those out or just indicate that those are items where, and, and maybe just perhaps a, a better definition than no target, but mm -hmm. actually saying we are tracking. Why there's no target and that we're tracking the number. I, I think, again, popul that's, we consider that, right, there are sort of yeah. some neutral indicators that don't have a direction one way or the other because we can't control the direction. Um, so, so just to whatever language you think is appropriate mm -hmm. to say the reason that there's no target here is, is because this is not something we can control. And then I think on my end, I would still love to be able to say, well, if we invest, and another 500 attorneys, which I believe is what we've done, hopefully that will 
reduce it, and then I'd love to set targets around it because my hope is that we're investing in reducing that. But at least for the things where it's just it's tracking so people can see it, that is helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the, the PMMR, thank you for making that an open data set as well as the MMR. I think this is the first year the PMMR is an open data set, so thank you. Uh, at the city council, we've got some folks who do data crunching and are data scientists, and uh, they ran an analysis which we hadn't shared with you. We should have shared with you. I apologize for you on that one. Um, and our hope is once we share it with you, what we had found is 107 of the indicators, 70 of which were critical, were 28% or more uh, had a discrepancy from the FY16 and the PMR and the average performance over the past three years. So um, we'll share this data with you. Would you commit to working with us to try to look into what happened with those indicators? We'd certainly be happy to look at the analysis and comment on the analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, this year uh, the C City Council fulfilled its charter mandate on the PMR providing a response. And page 53 and 54, the last pages of our uh, somewhat lengthy budget response uh, included uh, uh, 57 recommendations to include specific indicators across 18 agencies. Um, Council Member Greenfield asked that I specifically point to the indicators within DCAS uh, because we both have a shared interest in the Board of Standards and Appeals, which we would like to see added to the uh, MMR and MMR, as would the Municipal Arts Society and others. Um, but uh, with regards to these pieces, and this came out on Monday, <laughs> uh, so have you had a chance to review any of these recommendations, and do you have any general thoughts with regards to these indicators? Well, um, first, thank you for acknowledging that we just received this list. Um, so we're not really in a position to comment at this time because we just got it, but also is the kind of thing that we need to fully review and discuss with the relevant agencies and deputy mayors. As I said uh, in my testimony and in, in some of my responses, adding indicators requires significant back and forth between agencies, operations, and city hall. And also, I think as Tina alluded to earlier, we need to make sure that any proposed indicator meets MMR guidelines. Is the agency actually covered? Uh, does the proposal fit within that rubric we have of services and goals that kind of defines the infrastructure of the MMR? Um, and that there's appropriate data that's available to measure the proposed indicator. Sometimes, you know, we all want to know a lot of things um, and just need to make sure that there would really be data behind it. So um, we're certainly uh, looking at this and we'll confer with all the colleagues and um, um, partners that we need to to respond. Thank you uh, very much for this hearing. Thank you for putting together the PMMR and the MMR at the same time as you're putting together Homestead at the same time as you're doing the municipal ID card as the same time as you're running many, many multi-city, uh, sorry, multi-agency city initiatives and uh, pleasure to work with you on this and we look forward to having the strongest and best uh, PMMR and MMR and as uh, noted, I do think it is, it is a, it is generations if not infinitely better than the 1997 versions of the <laughs> documents, though I am partial to clip art. <laughs> and uh, just uh, thank you for partnership. I look forward to working with you and hope that uh, we do see the changes in the MMR and PMMR. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Our uh, next panel will be the Independent Bud Budget Office with Lisa Neary followed by a panel with uh, Dick Dady from Citizens Union, which continues to have a near perfect attendance to the Governmental Operations Committee, even better than some of our council members. Do you swear to tell the uh, truth, the whole truth, uh, and to answer honestly to council member questions? I do. If you could state your name, title, and organization for the record, and please 
to begin your testimony. Sure. I'm Lisa Neary. I'm the general counsel at the Independent Budget Office. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the preliminary mayor's management report. Um, IBO last offered testimony on the mayor's management report in December of last year. We focused our comments then on the content of the MMR, specifically on legislation requiring that citizen surveys become part of the annual process, which we viewed as an important step toward creating an M MMR that was more accurately reflective of how the city's communities experience and perceive the delivery of city services. Today, I am going to focus less on content and more on the process, specifically on the timing of the publication of the PMMR and the MMR, an issue that has come up in prior council hearings and over the years um, in prior IBO testimony as well. Although the PMMR report is released prior to the council's hearings on the mayor's preliminary budget, which allows the information, as you know, to be used in discussions around the preliminary budget, the timing of the report's release limits the amount of information that the report can contain. As you know, the performance indicators contained in the PMMR reflect only the first four months of the city's fiscal year, July through October. With only this partial picture in hand, the council lacks cru crucial information that would allow you to link objectives to resources and resources to outcomes. Without these tools, the council's ability to gauge the effectiveness, the successes and failures of the city's programs put forward in the mayor's preliminary budget is limited. One example of this limitation, in the most recent PMMR, there are many indicators related to the Department of Education's efforts to improve academic achievement that are listed as not available, including over one dozen that have been identified as critical to achieving this goal. Though identified as critical information, because the PMMR is issued so early in the fiscal year, the information cannot be collected and reported. The September release of the MMR is arguably even more poorly timed. As you know, budget decisions are typically the focus of the council's attention from January through June. For the MMR to have maximum influence on these decisions, its release date would need to be within this period. One suggestion IBO has made in the past would be to release a version of the MMR in conjunction with the release of the mayor's executive budget in April. With this change in the timing, the council would potentially have several more months of crucial performance-related information available as the budget negotiations took shape for the upcoming fiscal year. In addition, the council would be, able, would be in a better position to suggest additional MMR indicators related to the mayor's budget initiatives going forward. In this way, an improvement in the timing of the release of the MMR could, contrib con could contribute to the improvement in its content as well. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to take any questions. So when would you want to see the PMMR and when exactly? So the, mayor, the MMR you would see in June and when would you do PMMR? Um, you know, I think, I think the point of our testimony really is just to make sure that people are thinking about the timing of these reports and how to maximize the amount of information they can contain um, at, a, at a point in time when decisions are being made about um, the allocation of resources. Um, the problem with the PMMR, as I, as I said, is that it, it really can only contain four months, one quarter's worth of information, which doesn't really help you. Um, so maybe you would have, you know, an MMR with the exec and then one that reflected performance for the whole year again in October or November or something. But um, I think the, the key thing is to have as much information as you can at the time that you're making resource allocation decisions. With regard to resource allocations, I asked a couple questions around performance budgeting and also compliance with the charter, which requires uh, time performance to budget allocations. Uh, do you think that the current PMMR and MMR in compliance, and do you believe that the budget function analysis would satisfy the requirements of the charter? If you need me to, I can go back and read the section if it is helpful. Or yeah, you know, I, I actually, in preparation for this hearing, looked at the PMMR section of the section 12 of the charter um, and saw that there were 
there was a requirement that there be suggested um, indicators for in the preliminary budget in the preliminary PMMR um, MMR uh, for indicators going forward, um, which I guess arguably the PMMR does contain. But to answer your question specifically, I would have to study more. I would be interested in an independent budget office review of the PMR, where it is with regard to charter uh, requirements and uh, any places we could make improvements. As you are well aware with hearing number three on this exact topic, this is of the utmost importance to me. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And so our uh, final panelist will be Dick Dady from Citizens Union. Uh, we thank Citizens Union for all that they do. I sometimes uh, mislabel this committee, not as the Governmental Operations Committee, but as the Good Government Committee, uh, mostly because of how much we do work with Citizens Union and the other good government groups. I uh, would be remiss if I didn't also note that uh, part of what makes government work is when we have a fourth estate and that requires a strong press and an independent press and a press that is willing to cover uh, boring issues like the management of the city of New York. And so I do want to thank Citizens Union for its uh, Gotham Gazette and their coverage of important issues at the council. And they're and here today. Yes, you are. So uh, thank you. And uh, if you could state your name and organization for the record. And uh, thank you for your near perfect attendance. I think we, no, I, th I think you've only missed, I don't, I you, you have better attendance. At, your, your organization has better attendance here than most council members. Let's be clear that it's the organization's presence. It's a rare opportunity for me to uh, testify before this committee, but I'm pleased to do so today. And uh, uh, Councilmember Kalis, I want to thank you for your leadership on so many issues and on so many levels uh, in really bringing the kind of oversight uh, that is so necessary to ensuring that our government operates as effectively and as efficiently as it can and with uh, good government principles behind it. Um, now I'm, my name is Dick Dady. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Union, uh, a nonpartisan good government group uh, dedicated to making democracy work for all New Yorkers. We serve as a civic watchdog, combating corruption, and fighting for political reform. Thank you again for the invitation to testify today before the uh, uh, about the 2016 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report. We have previously engaged on this issue many times, having testified before this committee over the past five years at similar oversight hearings, and served on the Mayor's Management Report Roundtable, convened by the Mayor's Office of Operations in 2012. The Roundtable's goal was to redesign the MMR to make it more user-friendly to the public and more effective as a measurement of agency performance. We've been pleased to see that several recommendations from that discussion have been implemented, but more need to be, re, uh, need, need to be embraced. Uh, we believe that the improvements that could be made uh, to both the substance and the presentation of the reports that would allow for better understanding of, of our government's performance of and plans for service delivery, and which would strengthen accountability and transparency, are contained herein. These recommendations are broken now into three major uh, categories. One is the setting targets for, uh, for over half of the city's performance indicators. The other is providing more detailed budgetary information and expanding reporting on cross-agency initiatives. And these are recommendations that we've made in the past. They're observations that we have uh, provided uh, to this committee and uh, uh, publicly, and we are again making them uh, uh, once again, which I, I guess goes to a problem that or goes to a challenge that we face is that uh, we've been back here several times uh, making the same recommendations, and while some of them get adopted, we think that some of the more common sense ones are not being embraced and we're at a loss to understand why. And particularly if you take a look at number one, you know, as we've noted in testimony over the years, you know, much information is needed to present a comprehensive view of the city's performance targets. Uh, this year we conducted an analysis of the preliminary manor, mayor's management report and found that targets are specified for less than half of the 1,964 performance indicators, less than half uh, within the text of this report. So while some targets are given direction, you know, to reduce or increase the number, uh, still more indicators do not have any, any articulated targets, and more indicators are without targets for fiscal year 2017 than they are for fiscal year 2016. So we're going in the opposite direction here. Uh, as you can see, our data shows in comparison 2016 to 2017 you know, specified targets, um, there were more in 2016 than there were in 2017. Uh, directional targets, they were about the same, uh, exactly the same uh, at 94. 
And that there was no target uh, for uh, 948 in 2016, and, and that rose to 961 in 2017. This is uh, somewhat disconcerting because a critical aspect of these management re reports is to publicly disclose the goals that agencies have established to improve on their performance. Uh, the lack of targets indicates one of two uh, possible uh, troubling possibilities, either that agencies experience difficulty in setting goals in coordination with the office of the mayor, or that these goals have been established but are not being concealed, or, or possibly being concealed uh, from the public. Uh, neither is satisfactory. Uh, and as you can see on the second page uh, is a detailed listing of the, um, oh wait a minute. Excuse me. I've got it. You got it? Okay. I, I've also got my own spreadsheet with the same information. <laughs> so, um, but the, um, so as you can see, the information there is um, uh, laid out in, in a very detailed way. Uh, there may be copies of that that may be incomplete. Uh, if you can see, if you can get, get one for me, that'd be great. Um, looks like the assembly was not the, the, the as well as I, I would have thought. But anyway, in, moving on to number two, and this is something we've also provided in the past, um, providing more detailed. Um, where is that? Here, you can give them my. Oh, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, okay. I got. So. Um, as you can see, uh, all these that are listed, um, and they're not as comprehensive as we would like, I mean, it's, it's pretty telling, uh, the number of uh, agencies that, uh, uh, that do not have any targets uh, for, for the delivery of services. And I'm not sure how we can have an effective document uh, if you have half of the performance indicators not being indicated at all. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, the, office, uh, the mayor's office needs to be challenged on and pushed on. Uh, because if this is to be a, 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 an effective tool, it needs to be a complete tool. Number two, uh, we also believe that more detailed budget information should be included in the MMR. Uh, we've said this in the past, uh, and we believe that because we need to accurately measure the effectiveness of each agency. While general budget information is provided for each agency, including expenditures, revenues, personnel costs, capital, and overtime expenditures, there's no way to tell if service delivery reflects dollars well spent. The MMR and the PMMR should provide detailed budget information for each agency service delivery goal established. This would enable the mayor and the council during its budget hearings to determine the levels of funding appropriate for each service delivery goal agencies are trying to achieve. And I was quite interested to hear the IBO talk about the need to change the timing of these two reports to better align themselves with uh, uh, the budget cycle and so that the, uh, the budget decisions can be better informed. Uh, you know, we also understand that other budget documents produced by the Council and the Office of Management and Budget contain more detailed financial information for agencies. However, these documents do not measure performance, and we cannot stress enough that the need for the LMB to make detailed agency spending uh, available that is linked to actual program performance more transparent and accessible to the public, and that the MMR is one important way to deliver this information. And I think it was actually part of the recommendations that the um, uh, roundtable made. Number three, you know, expand reporting on cross-agency initiatives to include data on transparency and voting programs. And this is something that you are very much concerned about, Council Member and Chair, uh, as a Citizens Union. Uh, and that uh, the PMMR is currently structured to share information, uh, not just about agency performance, but also about the cross-agency programs, such as Hurricane Sandy Recovery and Vision Zero. We believe that this, fe we believe that this fe feature is valuable uh, for assessing key projects initiated by the mayor and would like to see it expand to include additional programs that are crucial for good government in New York City. And I want to list a couple of those that we believe should be added uh, that particularly engage in transparency and accountability. And it's important uh, to track the progress and set targets for, these, for, the, for the growth in these areas. And they include complying with the pro-voter law, uh, requiring certain agencies to provide voter registration opportunities. I mean, that was a, uh, a program that had gone off the rails and uh, you and your committee had provided some oversight on that and we got the mayor's office to do a much better job of making uh, um, the registration, voter registration forms available at the time that uh, uh, New Yorkers interact with city agencies. But we have not seen any kind of um, numbers. It would be nice to see numbers as part of the mayor's management report. Responding to freedom of information, FOIA requests, uh, webcasting and recording and publishing public meetings and hearings. I mean, one of the great initiatives over the last number of years has been putting a lot online uh, and webcasting uh, many of these, uh, almost all of the council hearings and public meetings. Um, but would, would be nice to know if, in fact, and as well as agency hearings, it would be nice to know uh, the extent to which the um, 
the agencies are complying with the law, uh, also including data on the open data portal. We know while there's one performance indicator addressing data sets on the open data portal within the Department of Information Technology and Communications portion of the uh, report, more information about the implementation of the overall open data law uh, should be shared within this report. Uh, for example, the report could track the number of data sets published by the open data portal by agency and within each agency section of the report as it could do for all four of these cross-agency programs. This would be a, a wonderful way to understand how information to the public is being um, <coughs> provided and if it's living up to the promise uh, and the uh, construct of the open data law. Um, and so that's more or less our three major recommendations. Uh, they mirror some of the ones that we've made in the past and we thank you for the opportunity to present our ideas once again. Uh, thank you. Thank you for weighing in on this issue. Uh, I, I will share that when I first dug into the MMR data and I saw that half the time we didn't set goals and I believe that came up at our first hearing, uh, I'm glad that I'm not the only one who is concerned about this and I appreciate it and look forward to working with Citizens Union and your members to <coughs> make sure we set specific targets even directional targets where necessary, but the fact that half of them have no target is a uh, concern. Uh, with re Let me just, I, I will read the section of the charter. So it requires an appendix indicating the relationship between the program performance goals included in the management report pursuant to paragraph so on such and such of the corresponding, and the corresponding expenditures made pursuant to the adopted, sorry, I'm reading from the MMR section, let me read from the PMMR section. It requires an appendix indicating the relationship between the program performance goals and the measures included in the management report pursuant to paragraph two of the subdivision and the corresponding appropriations contained in the preliminary budget. Uh, do you believe that the uh, PMMR currently complies with the charter requirement as I just read? Not necessarily, no. Um, it, it has a ways to go in terms of matching the, uh, the spirit, the full spirit and the uh, uh, requirement. And then with regard to reporting across agencies, you're, you're preaching to the choir, so you would expect, would, would you expect to see a pro-voter law section as part of the multi-agency report along with Vision Zero, or would you expect to see a pro-voter law indicator added to each of the agencies that is part of the pro-voter law? The latter. Uh, okay. yeah, the latter. Same thing for freedom of information, exactly. webcasting, and right what data sets right. they have in the right. open data portal. I mean, exactly. I mean, we're gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens now with this um, open FOIL portal um, that is underway and is in its beta phase. Um, and that will be an important thing to track as well. Um, but regardless of that, th th these kind of things, particularly since these are really um, about citizens having access to information and being able to be engaged in the democracy of the city, uh, it seemed to me that would be a very important thing to have uh, since it, the MMR and the MMR are focused on uh, transparency and accountability measures. And I, I, I will note that uh, the Commission on Public Information and Communication, which Citizens Union also has near perfect attendance, I think actually perfect attendance at, also is digging right into the webcasting issue under the leadership of public advocate James right. to make sure that we're actually connecting everyone in the city with the webcast and actually taking on the challenge of something more than a hundred different agencies, commissions, and institutions, including I think the fund for the city of New York or the mayor's fund, which uh, we believe should be webcasting as well. I think we have an exact list. If anyone's interested, we can share that from the Commission on Public Information. So, And to that point, I mean, it would be nice to see not only, you know, ensure that the agencies are complying with the uh, law, but also the number of people who are using it. I mean, the number of people who are actually tu tuning in. Um, and maybe, I'm not sure if the council has access to that information, but maybe making the council uh, issue an annual report in terms of the number of uh, webcast hearings, which they have done very well, uh, and the number of people that tune in. It would be nice to, to have that information. I mean, how many New Yorkers you're reaching who can't um, turn out during the day for a hearing such as this. I think we might either be uh, greatly uh, happy or greatly ashamed uh, by the uh, interest. Uh, thank you. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should no, have? I think, uh, as always, you're very complete and thorough. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you for everyone who is here. Thank you again to Gauth Mouzet and other members of the press. I know that we have uh, reporters from Manhattan Institute viewing this as well. Thank you. Uh, ultimately, we are working uh, to uh, do our charter mandated job of oversight with regard to the Flinner Mayor's Management Report. We've got our first response uh, to the budget that has included information on the PMMR, and we look forward to continue to do oversight. Uh, please expect uh, more in the executive budget hearings. Please also expect further hearings when the MMR comes out, which we are hoping to have many changes to reflect the conversations we've had today. Uh, if you are a member of the public and you have not had a chance to comment and you would like to submit comments, please feel free to email policy at benkalos, K-A-L-L-O-S, uh, dot com, and we will do our best to add it to the record. Uh, thank you, and uh, we will have another hearing this month and a uh, topic to be announced and hope to see everybody soon. Thank you.